Hello everyone, welcome back to Rotor Dynamics 101. In this video, I'm going to walk you through some really important concepts in lateral rotor dynamic analysis. We'll talk about the damped natural frequency map, how to interpret it, then move on to rotor response and mode shapes. And finally wrap up with amplification factor and separation margins. These analyses are essential for anyone working with high-speed rotating machinery, whether it's compressor, pumps, turbines, or even rocket engines. Let's start with the damped natural frequency map. If you take a look at this figure, you will see the x-axis represents rotor speed, and the y-axis shows the natural frequency of the system. Now, here's something important you'll notice the natural frequency lines are not straight. That's because in this case, the bearing stiffness was modeled to change with speed, which is very common in turbo machinery. Bearings, especially fluid film types, have frequency dependent stiffness and damping. That's why the natural frequencies shifts as the rotor speed increases. So in short, as the machine running speed changes, the bearing stiffness changes, which changes the natural frequencies, and that's what gives these curves in the damped natural frequency map. Before we dive in further, let me just highlight a few key takeaways. In the industry, most of the lateral rotor dynamic analysis is linear and steady state. And plotting a damped natural frequency map is a very common task. And usually, the most accurate way to understand critical speed is to combine eigen analysis with force response analysis. That combination gives you a much better picture of how serious each critical speed might be. To create this kind of plot, you'll need bearing stiffness, damping coefficients, and something called the virtual mass or added mass. These values can be either supplied by the bearing manufacturer and can also be measured directly using a test rig or can be estimated through analysis tools that calculate stiffness, damping, and virtual mass. In this example, I've set the bearing stiffness to decrease with speed, which again can be seen in wheel machines. Now, if you look at the figure again, the red circles highlight where the rotor speed matches a natural frequency. That's where resonance occurs. But here's a critical point. Not all resonances are equally problematic. That depends on how well each mode is damped. So to assess that, we look at the damping ratio map underneath. From this map, you can see that as rotor speed increases, the damping ratio also increases. This is because as the bearing stiffness drops, the damping becomes more effective. Now for turbo machinery, a damping ratio below 0.05, which is equivalent to a log decrement of around 0.31, can be a concern. It does not always mean instability, but it might allow some subsynchronous whirl to show up. The actual threshold really depends on your machine and how accurately it's been modeled. But this gives you a rough guideline. Let's now shift to rotor response and mode shapes. We'll pick up right where we left off with the same rotor and bearing model. Now, to understand how the rotor actually moves the first step is to look at the mode shapes at each critical speed. The critical speed is when the rotor speed line up with one of the natural frequencies. Take a look at the first mode. There's a node point near the bearing, meaning the motion there is almost zero. That means the bearing is very stiff and does not allow much movement, which also means it does not contribute much damping. You can confirm that by looking at the damping ratio map again. This mode likely have low damping and could be more vulnerable. 
Now let's look at the second mode. This one has a node in the center of the shaft. And you'll notice the motions at the bearing locations are higher compared to the first mode. But keep in mind, the mode shape does not tell the full story. Just because the bearing location shows more motion at the second critical speed does not automatically mean the vibrations will be higher there compared to the first critical speed. To really understand the vibration levels, we need to also look at the damping ratio map. Notice that the damping ratio is actually higher for the second natural frequency. That extra damping reduces the vibration response at the second critical speed, around 9,000 RPM. You can see this clearly in the top right figure showing the rotor response analysis. We'll go through rotor response analysis in detail later in this video. Again, please note that also the natural frequency drops with increasing speed. Again, that's due to the stiffness model we used, where bearing stiffness decreases with speed. All right, now let's move into rotor response analysis. To do this, we need to define the rotor imbalance. This is the main excitation input. Here we'll examine two imbalance cases. In the first case, we are applying the API standard. And API stands for American Petroleum Institute. Their imbalance spec is four times the bearing load divided by the rotor speed. This spec is commonly used for high-speed, high-pressure machines like compressors and turbines. API standard balance spec equates approximately to an ISO balance grade G0.7 for machines with moderate performance requirements. Some companies opt for ISO grade G2.5. The corresponding imbalance limit is determined using 15 times the rotor weight divided by the rotor speed. Or you can use the ISO chart to draw a line and find the allowable imbalance. For example, if the defined speed is 3000 RPM, locate 3000 RPM on the x-axis, the speed, and draw a vertical line upward until it intersects the G2.5 line. From that point, draw a horizontal line towards the y-axis, which represents the residual specific imbalance. This gives a value of approximately eight grams times millimeter divided by kilograms. So please note that to calculate the actual residual imbalance, you'll need to multiply this value by the rotor mass, which is the bearing supported mass. As you can see, the imbalance value obtained from the chart closely matches the one calculated using the equation, confirming consistency between the two methods. In most cases, lateral dynamics requirements are evaluated by looking at the damped imbalance responses at probe locations. In many setup, displacement probes are positioned at plus minus 45 degrees from the top of the machine, as shown in this figure. In some cases, the probes are installed in horizontal and vertical orientations instead. Here is a typical process to evaluate imbalance responses. First, we introduce specific imbalance distributions to target individual modes of the rotor. Next, we simulate how the rotor responses in terms of vibration. And finally, we check whether the critical speed separation margins meet the required thresholds. Now that we define the imbalance, Let's set the observation points for rotor motion. In this case, we will set at both bearings and at the middle of the shaft. For imbalance response analysis, 
we are applying the imbalance at two separate planes, both located at the impeller positions. In the first case, we will use a G2.5 balance quality level at the impeller location. In the second case, we will tighten that tolerance to G0.7, which is the API specification limit. This plot shows the vibration amplitude at each of those points, which are left bearing, mid span, and right bearing locations. Using the ISO G2.5 imbalance specification. As you could see in the damped natural frequency map, the first critical speed appears at 3000 RPM and the second critical speed at 9,000 RPM. Now we look at the imbalance response plot. Notice what happens at the first critical speed around 3,000 RPM. The rotor vibration becomes quite large. This is expected because whenever the operating speeds line up with natural frequencies, the system resonates and the vibration amplitude increases significantly. If we dig a little deeper into the mode shape, we can see something interesting. The vibration at the bearing locations don't move very much, but the mid span of the rotor shows a much larger motion. That makes sense because the first critical speeds vibration mode shape is bending mode and the bearing support locations are node points with minute vibration, while the middle of the shaft deflects more. Looking at the numbers here, the peak vibration amplitude at the bearing is about 0 0.05 millimeter, while at the mid span, it's about 0 0.8 millimeters. So more than 10 times larger. And here's an important note, the Y axis scales for these amplitude plots are not the same. So when you're comparing the peak value, be careful not to misinterpret the relative magnitudes. Now let's move on to the second critical speed, which occurs at around 9,000 RPM. If you look at the mode shape, you will notice that the middle of the shaft has very little motion in this mode. That's why in the rotor response amplitude plot, the bearing locations actually show more vibration than the shaft mid span at this speed. The peak amplitude at the bearing location is about 0 0.023 millimeter, while the vibration at the middle of the shaft remains quite small. All right, now let's take a look at case two for the imbalance response analysis. In comparison, here is the response when applying the API specification, which is equivalent to ISO grade G0.7. As expected, the vibration amplitudes are lower with the API spec due to its tighter balance tolerance. As you could imagine, the greater the imbalance in the rotor assembly, the higher the vibration levels will be. Of course, each company tends to follow its own internal standards, often shaped by machine type and past field experiences. Let's also talk about amplification factor, or AF, and how it's used to define separation margin. The amplification factor tells us how much vibration grows at resonance. A higher amplification factor means the system is more sensitive to excitation. We can use the half power bandwidth method to estimate the amplification factor. Here is how it works. Find the peak amplitude at resonance, which is omega n. Multiply that amplitude by 0 0.707 to get 70% of the peak. Then find the two frequencies, omega one and omega two, on either side of the peak 
that match that 70% value. Finally, calculate the amplification factor using the following equation here. If your amplification factor is below 2.5, the system is considered well damped and a separation margin isn't required. Once the amplification factor exceeds 2.5, a separation margin of about 15% is recommended, meaning your operating speed should stay safely away from the critical speed. If the amplification factor goes above 3.55, that separation margin increases to around 20%. And just to clarify, a lower amplification factor is better. It indicates more effective damping and less vibration amplification near resonance. All right, that wraps up today's video. In this session, we looked at damped natural frequency map and how mode shapes, damping ratios, and imbalance response are all connected to give a complete picture of rotor behavior. Remember, it's not just about the critical speeds. It's about understanding the whole system response. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.